Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the latest in AMA's What Physicians Need to Know webinar series. Today, we're talking about monkeypox with a special focus on the antiviral ticoviramat, also known as T-pox, its use as well as its availability as a treatment for this disease. I'm Dr. Sandra Freihofer, board chair of the American Medical Association. I'm in private practice, general internal medicine in Atlanta. I'm also adjunct associate professor of medicine at Emory and AMA's liaison to ACIP, the CDC's advisory committee on immunization practices. And I'm delighted to be here today to take part in this important discussion. In just a moment, I'll introduce today's experts from FDA and CDC. They'll talk about monkeypox, what it is and what it isn't, what it means for physicians, as well as current treatment options, but, and what happens next. But we, before we get to the topic that brings us here today, allow me to acknowledge each of you. We've been through a lot over the past two years, more than we could have imagined, and honestly, more than what we were prepared for. But today, there's progress the daily average of new reported COVID cases has continued to fall, a trend we've been seeing since the beginning of August. Cases are falling in all but a few states. Americans are vaccinated and boosted, and more help is on the way. A new bivalent COVID booster targeting both the original virus strain as well as Omicron BA4 and BA5 subvariants is now widely available for those 12 and older. We strongly encourage you to talk to your patients about the importance of getting this updated booster at least two months after completing a primary COVID vaccine series or their last COVID booster dose. It's crucial that we continue our progress to protect patients from hospitalizations and deaths due to COVID. We've learned from our uncoordinated response to COVID how important it is to contain an outbreak in its early stages. Already in the U.S., more than 20,000 cases of monkeypox have been reported. Just like COVID, the total number of infections is certainly higher than current figures indicate. Already, there are more than 54,000 cases in 93 countries, countries that have not historically reported monkeypox in the past. And unlike COVID, where we had to invent vaccines and antivirals, we already have vaccines and therapeutics that can be used to protect and treat patients from monkeypox. Ticoviramat, aka T-pox, which we're going to discuss in depth today, was FDA approved for treatment of smallpox in adults and children in 2018. Its use for other orthopox virus infections, including monkeypox, is not approved by FDA. However, this drug is being made available through EA IND expanded access investigational new drug protocol, which we'll explain here today. Now, this is different than EUA, emergency use authorizations, that we've all become accustomed to during the pandemic. It's important to understand the distinctions. We've heard from many of you that the process for obtaining and utilizing TPOX has been cumbersome and has led to significant delays in treatment in some cases. CDC and FDA have worked together to update protocols for use of TPOX in order to make it easier to increase access to treatment. We'll talk more about that with today's panel of experts. Here's the plan. After introductions, each of our guests will share a presentation. Then we'll move into a Q&A session to address some of the questions you've submitted. First, I'd like to welcome Dr. Adam Sherwat, Deputy Director of the Office of Infectious Diseases at the FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. Dr. Sherwat will provide his expert insight on the status of TPOX as an IND, investigational new drug, and what that means for us as physicians and for our patients. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Sherwat. We're also delighted to have infectious disease expert, Dr. Timothy Wilkin, Professor of Medicine and Assistant Dean for Clinical Research Compliance for Human Research Com Protections at Weill Cornell Medicine. Dr. Wilkins, a clinical trial researcher with a focus on prevention of HPV-related cancer in people living with HIV. He also chairs a clinical trial looking at ticoviramat for treatment of monkeypox in humans. Also joining us today is Dr. Brett Peterson. 
Dr. Peterson is captain of the U.S. Public Health Service and deputy chief of CDC's pox, virus, and rabies branch. Dr. Peterson will tell us more about the streamlined process required for TPOX, which eases the burden on physicians by making it easier to access this treatment for our patients. CDC has played a critical role in our ongoing response to monkeypox, and we'll also hear more about recent developments. We are so fortunate to have these three experts with us today. So let's get started. Dr. Sherwat, we'll start with you. So I am going to provide a regulatory perspective on Ticovirumat. Next slide, please. This is my disclaimer. Next slide, please. So Ticovirumab is an antiviral drug that inhibits viral spread to uninfected cells by directly and specifically targeting the orthopox virus protein VP37, which is involved in producing extracellular envelope virions. Ticovirumab was approved for the treatment of smallpox disease under a regulation known as the animal rule. The animal rule allows for approval of drugs when human efficacy studies are not ethical and field trials to study the effectiveness of drugs or biological products are not feasible. Under the animal rule, efficacy is established based on adequate and well-controlled studies in animal models of the human disease or condition of interest. Next slide, please. So establishing efficacy under the animal rule. Um, in this case, conducting clinical trials to study ticovirumab for the treatment of smallpox was neither feasible nor ethical. Smallpox is an eradicated disease and exposing study participants to variola virus or the smallpox virus is not ethical. And there were scientific and logistical constraints with the use of variola virus in animal models. Therefore, efficacy was established based on studies of non-human primates infected with monkeypox and rabbits infected with rabbitpox virus. These studies demonstrated improved survival in animals that received ticovirumab compared to animals that received placebo. Next slide, please. I just provided this slide to remind you that you can reference the U.S. prescribing information for additional details on efficacy. Uh, this table is taken directly out of the um, prescribing information and it outlines in detail what the results were from the efficacy studies. Next slide, please. So establishing safety under the animal rule. Approvals that, we, um, that go forward under the animal rule still require establishing an adequate safety database like any other drug or biologic product. The safety of Ticovirumab was evaluated in 359 healthy adult subjects aged 18 to 79 years in a placebo-controlled clinical trial. These subjects had neither smallpox nor monkeypox. Adverse reactions occurring in greater than or equal to 5% of subjects receiving ticovirumab included headache in 12% and nausea in 5%. There were no deaths or serious adverse events that were considered to be related to ticovirumab. Next slide, please. Select an effective dose. Ticovirumab exposures achieved in healthy human subjects were compared with those observed in the animal models of rabbit pox and monkeypox infection at the doses that were associated with maximum effectiveness. For ticovirumab, the selection of a maximum human dose was constrained by neurologic findings and animal toxicology studies. However, ticovirumab exposures achieved in healthy humans at the recommended dose are higher than the therapeutic exposures in the relevant animal models. Next slide, please. So there are a number of uncertainties that are inherent in animal rule approvals. Um, one is that drugs that are effective in animal studies are not always effective in humans, and we've seen that before in, in, uh, in clinical development programs. Another is that a drug's safety and pharmacokinetic profile may differ in healthy people versus people with a disease of interest, in this case, monkeypox. So post-marketing studies, such as field studies, are required to verify and describe a drug's clinical benefit and to assess its safety when used as indicated when such studies are feasible and ethical. Next slide, please. So a question that we've received before is why was ticovirumab not approved for treatment of monkeypox under the animal rule? So monkeypox disease did not meet the animal rule requirement that human efficacy studies are not ethical 
and field trials to study the effectiveness of drugs or biological products are not feasible. At the time of Ticavir Med approval, there were parts of the world, including in Western Central Africa, where monkeypox disease was endemic and clinical trials could be conducted. Next slide, please. For this slide, I just wanted to cover some of the knowledge gaps and potential liabilities of the use of ticoviramat. The efficacy, safety, and pharmacokinetics of ticoviramat in the treatment of monkeypox in humans have not been demonstrated. Also, ticoviramat must be administered with a moderate to high fat meal to achieve target drug exposures. Another significant issue is the low barrier to resistance of the drug. This was based on results in cell culture, animal studies, and clinical case reports. Some of the resistance pathways require only a single amino acid change in the viral VP37 drug target to cause a substantial reduction in ticoviramet antiviral activity. Next slide, please. So current access to ticoviramet is via an NIAID-sponsored randomized controlled clinical trial and also via an intermediate size expanded access IND protocol or EAP held by the CDC. Data from randomized controlled trials are critically needed to address knowledge gaps related to efficacy, safety, pharmacokinetics in humans with monkeypox, and to monitor for development of resistance to ticoviramet. All are essential in guiding clinical and regulatory decision making. Therefore, healthcare providers should encourage their patients with monkeypox infection to be evaluated for enrollment in NIAID's randomized controlled trial. For patients for whom enrollment in this trial is not feasible, for example, a clinical trial site is not geographically accessible, the use of ticoviramet under CDC's expanded access protocol should be consistent with applicable guidelines for ticoviramet use. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to present the study on behalf of my co-investigators, as well as the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Great. Um, so we have rapidly developed this protocol at the request of uh, NIH and NIAID. This um, protocol is part of our national plan for um, responding to the monkeypox, um, human monkeypox epidemic. Um, so we are, I'm glad to say that we enrolled our first person uh, last week on September 8th, and we will ramp up the protocol in the weeks to come as more and more sites come on board. Next slide. Um, so the study is um, really two studies in one. Uh, first, we have a randomized, uh, double-blinded, placebo-controlled portion where we are asking the question is uh, trying to answer whether uh, ticoviramat is effective for the treatment of human monkeypox disease. Um, we also have a second portion of the study where we provide open-label uh, ticoviramat for certain populations, including children, people who are pregnant, people with severe disease, severe immunosuppression, or severe skin disease that puts them at risk for uh, severe outcomes from this uh, disease. So the study population are those with symptomatic human monkeypox virus infection. This is a superiority design. Uh, the primary outcome is time to clinical resolution that we'll discuss in a moment. Um, and the participation for the participant is over two months. Uh, originally, we hoped to enroll the study in eight weeks. That may or may not be possible as the uh, st a case, number of cases starts to decline in the U.S., and we're studying weight-based oral ticoviramat. And of note, I have the clinicaltrials.gov um, information below uh, as well. Next slide. Um, so our hypothesis is that ticoviramat will lead to faster clinical resolution of human monkeypox virus disease compared to placebo will compare the time to clinical resolution. And we're defining this primary endpoint of clinical resolution as when all skin lesions are scabbed over, desquamated or healed, and all visible mucosal lesions are healed as well. So we're assessing this with a combination of, of, of uh, sources of data, including daily skin checks by the participants, as well as photographs, um, when the person reports clinical resolution, we'll conduct uh, remote uh, visits and video visits to confirm resolution, as well as confirming at an in-person visit when scheduled. Next slide. So just to give you an idea of the primary endpoint, uh, you can see on the left is a scabbed over lesion, as well as uh, on the second to the left. 
And further over, after the scabs have fallen off and these lesions have resolved. So this is clearly a subjective outcome and people can be infect or people can have um, uh, upwards of a hundred lesions. Um, so it, uh, it is a, a difficult primary endpoint to assess. And I will note that there have been no clinical trials conducted in this area. Uh, so we are in some ways learning as we go. Next slide. Um, we have a whole host of secondary outcomes, including assessing pain, which is a major uh, presenting symptom for patients, uh, progression of severe disease, We'll look at clearance of human monkeypox virus in various places uh, with the hope that we can find a uh, surrogate endpoint for future studies. Um, and we are assessing pharmacokinetics, as Dr. Sherwat mentioned, uh, we have a dearth of data in this area. So we'll be assessing in the randomized portion as well as uh, for people who are pregnant and children across the age span. Next slide. Um, so for eligibility, we asked two questions. The first is, does the person have symptomatic human monkeypox virus disease? So they can either have confirmed infection, so a laboratory report that was obtained within the last seven days, or presumptive diagnosis, so skin, mucosal lesions, proctitis, consistent with the high probability of human monkeypox virus in the opinion of the site investigator, as well as an exposure, either sexual contact in the prior three weeks or close household exposure with someone known to be uh, infected with human monkeypox virus. We want to get uh, enroll people that are less than two weeks in duration of illness and have at least one active lesion or symptom to follow. Uh, people who are not pregnant uh, should agree to con contraception or abstinence, very flexible, uh, and ability to perform, provide informed consent. Next slide. The second question we asked is, are they appropriate for randomization? Um, so here are listed uh, the groups where we've decided they're not appropriate for randomization, that they should receive open-label ticodermat. Uh, so for people less than 18 years of age, we want to really focus on safety and pharmacokinetics. Uh, so everyone is in that group is receiving uh, open-label ticoviramat. Those with severe disease, we've defined that as suspected or confirmed ocular involvement, uh, lesions on the central face that could be disfiguring, uh, hospitalization, lesions that are severe and require uh, intervention, um, we have those with severe immunosuppression will receive open label ticoviramat. Uh, those with uh, certain skin conditions that we know from um, that place them at higher risk for these orthopox virus conditions. Uh, people who are pregnant or breastfeeding, and um, uh, people that are expected to have significant drug drug interactions with ticoviramat. We are uh, enrolling them are providing open label to EcoVirimed so we can uh, get more data on the drug interactions. Next slide. Um, so we, uh, the follow-up is scaffolded with weekly visits for a month. So five weekly visits for a month and then a visit uh, two months after. We assess with detailed examinations, swabs, blood. Uh, people have a de uh, detailed STI screen at baseline. Uh, there's participant uh, reported outcomes as well as the daily study diary through the first month. And I will point out that those that are originally in the randomized arm can move to open label ticoviramat if at any point they have progression to severe disease. So they develop eye lesions, central facial lesions, they're hospitalized, any of that, they move to open label ticoviramat, as well as people that have persistent severe pain that lasts for five days or more uh, are able to move to open label ticoviramat. Next slide. Uh, so we're powering this study for a uh, faster resolution of three days, a three days faster resolution of symptoms uh, that we believe that would be clinically meaningful. Um, next slide. And uh, as I said, we are open to accrual. We are hope to have 80 sites uh, eventually at uh, most major metropolitan areas. Um, so we will update the lists on the clinicaltrials.gov. We will have um, broader press releases that will um, have our open website. So you'll, and as well as a call center. So there'll be um, easy ways to refer uh, patients to the study. 
Um, there are other trials. There's a UK study that's ongoing that's completely remote. There's a smaller in scale Canadian trial that's opening soon um, and a more complicated platform trial uh, conducted by the WHO that will open in the coming weeks as well. Uh, so overall, uh, we are open to accrual. We try to address the concern of the community to have access for ticoviramat while still being able to have a controlled assessment of efficacy. Um, so we, we do hope to have uh, most people infected with ticoviramat in a community where the, the protocol is open to be referred to the protocol. I love the name of this study, STOMP. S-T-O-M-P. And I wonder if we Google clinical trial stomp, if we'll come up with it. But thank you so much for presenting that. And next, we'll hear from Dr. Peterson. Take it away. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to join this webinar. All right. Next slide. So my goal with my presentation is to really highlight uh, some of the resources in terms of guidance and other data that is available from CDC um, for regarding treatment with decaviramet. So I want to start by noting that uh, many individuals infected with monkeypox do have a mild self-limiting disease course, even in the absence of specific therapy. So for many patients, supportive care and pain control is really sufficient um, in treating this disease. However, the prognosis for monkeypox does depend on multiple factors, such as the previous vaccination status, initial health status, and concurrent illnesses or comorbidities. Next slide. And so with this in mind, CDC has tried to develop some treatment considerations for monkeypox. Um, the website is noted here, and I would suggest that folks keep a close eye on this website as there are some uh, expected updates coming very soon, likely this week. But the main treatment considerations is that persons should be considered for treatment um, who have either severe disease or at high risk for severe disease. For example, people with immunocompromising conditions, pediatric populations, pregnant or breastfeeding people, people with a history or presence of atopic dermatitis or other skin conditions, and people with one or more complications. And lastly, uh, persons who do have uh, lesions on sensitive anatomic areas that might lead to increased risk of serious sequelae should also be considered for treatment. Next slide. Now, ticoviramat, the subject of our webinar today, uh, as we've discussed, is really the, the uh, first line treatment uh, for monkeypox. I think we've heard about most of this already. I'll note that there, this uh, drug has been um, licensed as both an oral and IV formulation, and both of these formulations are available from the Strategic National Stockpile. And as noted earlier, CDC does hold an expanded access IND, which allows the use of this product um, for non varial orthopox virus infections, including monkeypox. Next slide. Now, in terms of the EAIND, CDC has worked with FDA to really make it easier for healthcare providers to provide this treatment to patients with monkeypox. The EAIND provides an umbrella regulatory coverage so that clinicians and facilities don't need to individually request um, INDs. And this ensures that there's liability coverage under the PREP Act if there are patients injured and um, they can receive compensation under the countermeasures injury compensation program. In terms of uh, implementing the EAIND, treatment with TPOX can begin upon receipt of the medication and after obtaining informed consent. There's no requirement for pre-registration for clinicians or facilities. And the forms uh, that are required under the EAIND can all now be returned to CDC after treatment begins. Next slide. The forms that are currently required include the informed consent form, a patient intake form, and the FDA Form 1572. A serious adverse event form, uh, the MedWatch form is also required if adverse events uh, uh, occur during treatment. A number of other optional forms and resources are available, including a patient diary, which patients can use to record how they feel and any side effects to TPOX, 
And um, what was previously required but is now optional is a clinical outcome form, which is still very helpful for us to document progress and outcome information post-treatment. Additionally helpful are photos of the lesions um, and in situations where resistance may be suspected, lesion samples can be collected and sent to CDC to assess for the development of antiviral resistance. And pharmacokinetic samples can also still be submitted optionally um, to monitor TPOX levels for adequate drug exposures. Next slide. The CDC has recently summarized the information that we've received from uh, patients and providers under the EAIND and published this in a recent MMWR. Um, what we've learned is that among 549 patients who have been treated under the EAIND, 99.8% received it orally and as an outpatient. And among the 369 patients for which we have data available, few adverse events were reported. So this really supports the continued um, provision of this drug under EAIND. Um, I'll also note in the figure here that um, the time from uh, onset of symptoms to initiation of treatment has also decreased, likely due to a number of factors, but um, uh, some of which being the, uh, the simplification of the process, um, as well as uh, increased uh, awareness and accessibility of uh, the product. Next slide. We continue to collect information on the demogra demographics of patients receiving ticaviramet. So you can see here, we're up to almost 2,000 patients for which we've received the patient intake form. And what we've seen is the demographics of the patients being treated with ticaviramet has closely uh, uh, tracked the uh, it demographics of the cases being reported. Um, so we continue to monitor this to um, ensure uh, access and um, equitable use of ticaviramet in this outbreak. Next slide. I want to point out that there are some other treatment options available. VIGIV is a product license for treatment of complications due to vaccinia vaccination or smallpox vaccination. Sidovavir is an antiviral medication that is approved by FDA for treatment of CMV retinitis in patients with AIDS. Um, both of these products uh, are do have activity against orthopox virus infections, although there's limited data to support their use specifically for monkeypox. Uh, CDC does hold an expanded access um, IND protocol to allow the use of these products um, for the treatment of monkeypox. Um, and both of these products are also available in the SNS. Uh, these products could be helpful adjuncts um, in treating severe cases of monkeypox who are already receiving ticaviramat, for example. Next slide. One other treatment option is brinsidofavir, which is an antiviral medication approved by FDA for treatment of smallpox. Um, it is not currently available from the SNS, but um, the BAR BARDA has awarded a contract to procure brinsidofavir for the SNS, so we do expect it to be available soon. And CDC is currently developing an expanded access IND protocol to help facilitate the use of this product uh, as a treatment for monkeypox as well. Next slide. Lastly, for ocular infections, which unfortunately we have seen during this outbreak, trifluoridine or viroptic is an antiviral medication that's licensed for treatment of herpes, conjunctivitis, or keratitis. And there is in vitro evidence of uh, trifluoridine activity against orthopox viruses. And we do have case reports of trifluoridine being used for vaccinia virus infections, for example, following smallpox vaccination. Um, as well as during this outbreak uh, for monkeypox. And previous anecdotal reports do suggest some benefit for treatment of ocular infections with trifluoridine. Next slide. So lastly, I just did want to highlight that there are some um, guidance and considerations for specific populations. So for treatment and prophylaxis in people with HIV, um, it is known that people with advanced HIV or those who are not virologically suppressed um, with antiviral, antiretroviral therapy can be at increased risk of severe disease. And we have unfortunately seen some severe cases um, uh, related to uh, uncontrolled HIV. Uh, Post-exposure prophylaxis and antiviral treatments are available for these individuals. 
and antiviral treatments have few interactions that we've noted with antiretroviral therapy and more information is available um, at this link here. Next slide. In terms of people who are pregnant or breastfeeding, this is another population uh, where um, there is increased risk for severe disease and these individuals should be prioritized for medical treatment when needed. Ticavirumab can be considered the first line antiviral given that there um, are no known um, fetal effects that were observed in animal studies, although human data is limited. Uh, however, with sidofovir and brinsidofovir, um, there is evidence of pyrogenicity in animal model studies. So uh, use in this population should, should be used with caution. Um, lastly, VIG administration can be considered after evaluating the risk and benefits for individual patients. Um, other immune globulin products have been widely used during pregnancy uh, for many years without any apparent negative reproductive effects. Next slide. Lastly, we do also have clinical considerations for monkeypox in children and adolescents. This is another population um, that has been seen to be at high risk for severe disease, particularly in um, children with eczema or other skin conditions. And so treatment can be considered on a case-by-case -case basis for children and adolescents um, who are at risk for severe disease or who develop complications of monkeypox. And ticavirumab is generally the first line medication to treat monkeypox in children and adolescents. Next slide. In terms of requesting medical countermeasures, um, ticavirumab and the other medical countermeasures can be requested um, for suspected, probable, or confirmed monkeypox cases. And contacting this, your state or territorial health department is really um, the first step in uh, making these requests. Uh, many of these uh, jurisdictions do have ticavirumab already pre-positioned and available use. Uh, but of course, CDC is available for urgent clinical situations and consultations after hours on weekends. And uh, we can be reached through our CDC Emergency Operations Center the numbers listed here. So I think that is my last slide and thank you again. Well, many thanks to all three of our guests for providing such valuable insight. And I know you have lots of questions and so let's get to those now. Whitney, if you're able to queue up the questions submitted, let's jump right in. Okay, the top question we've received from physicians around the country is about EUA. So here's the question. TPOX is already approved for use in the European Union as a treatment for monkeypox. There's already a significant amount of clinical outcome data from IND patients. European patients, JAMA and Lancet peer-reviewed articles, et cetera. Many scientists and physicians have advocated for immediate EUA based on this data. So why isn't that data being taken into consideration in addition to the risk-benefit ratio? Why is it not at least authorized to EUA to improve access here? And the bottom line, what additional data do we, do we need uh, on TPOX to, to, to have EUA granted? And let's, uh, I think FDA's Dr. Sherwatt, I think you're in the hot seat for this one. First, I want to provide a short overview of the regulatory framework related to emergency use authorizations. It's important to note that there are two types of relevant declarations, the 319 declaration and 564 declarations. A determination under Section 319 of the Public Health Service Act that a public health emergency exists, such as the declaration made on August 4, 2022, does not enable FDA to issue emergency use authorizations. A separate determination and declaration are needed under Section 564 of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act to enable FDA to issue emergency use authorizations provided other statutory criteria are met. On August 9, 2022 and September 7, 2022, the HHS Secretary declared under Section 564 of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act that circumstances exist justifying the authorization of emergency use of vaccines for monkeypox and in vitro diagnostics for the detection or diagnosis of infection of monkeypox virus, respectively. Neither of these EUA declarations cover the emergency use of therapeutics for treatment of monkeypox disease, and therefore FDA is not enabled to issue EUAs for therapeutics for the treatment of monkeypox disease at this time. 
Importantly, even if the requisite declaration for therapeutics were to be made, FDA would need to consider the circumstances and appropriateness of an EUA for a particular medical countermeasure and determine whether the criteria for issuance of an EUA have been met. Putting aside the explanation of the regulatory framework, we have been working very closely with our colleagues at CDC to fine-tune access via the expanded access protocol and with our colleagues at NIH and academia to facilitate the development of a randomized clinical trial that is now open for enrollment. As previously noted, at present, we have no data from randomized controlled trials demonstrating the safety or efficacy of ticoviramat for the treatment of monkeypox in humans. Data from randomized controlled trials are critically needed to address knowledge gaps related to efficacy, safety, pharmacokinetics, and to systematically monitor for the development of resistance to ticoviramat, all of which are essential in guiding clinical and regulatory decision-making. Therefore, healthcare providers should encourage their patients with monkeypox infection to be evaluated for enrollment in the randomized controlled trial. Wow. It sounds like T-pox EUA is caught in a lot of red tape, but thank you for, for that very complete answer, um, which leads us to the next question. How can physicians obtain T-pox? How has this process been simplified? And are there any plans to simplify this process further? Uh, Dr. Peterson, I know one of your slides addressed that, and I know you, uh, CDC has made has tried to make this easier. I guess it's it's easier than it could be. But can you ex can you reinforce what you told us earlier about that process, please? Sure. So in terms of requesting ticaviramat, uh, the best first source is always your state, territorial, local health department. Um, as I mentioned, many of those jurisdictions do already have ticaviramat available and pre-positioned. Um, in terms of the process of implementing the EAIND, as I mentioned, um, treatment can be started as soon as informed consent is obtained. Um, all of the required forms um, can be submitted after treatment is initiated. We've drastically decreased the number of forms that are required, and uh, many of the other processes have been made optional. So all of this is with the intent of simplifying the process of using this product um, under our EAIND. So I counted on your slide about four required forms, and there are about eight others that were optional. So it does sound like uh, you've simplified the process a, a good bit. So thank you there. Uh, another question, who is not eligible to receive TPOX under the EAIND? Can you answer that one as well, Dr. Peterson? We sure. So one. the only persons who are not eligible to receive treatment of ticoviramat under our EAIND are those who are not willing to sign the informed consent or those who have allergies to the product or any of the ingredients of the product. Otherwise, the EAIND is open um, for uh, patients of all ages. Um, there is weight-based dosing, but um, there's no age restriction in uh, using the product under our EAIND. So yeah. the severity of disease don't, no, doesn't matter. So a single lesion would qualify for the EAIND. Well, we would refer to our uh, treatment considerations. Um, obviously, those are the individuals that we think would benefit most from um, treatment with ticoviramat. So I think those would, what we would point to as uh, the guiding principles for who should be receiving uh, treatment. But in terms of eligibility, um, everyone is eligibility under the requirements of the EAIND. So you mentioned weight-based dosing. How many different size doses, dose capsules does it come in? It's or, a single okay. dose capsule that's available, 200 milligrams. Um, it's when you get below 13 kilograms uh, that you would need to have partial dosing. Um, and that, that's where some of the uh, challenges lie in oral dosing. So how do you do that in your study? Do you just take the capsule apart and put it in a baby capsule or what do you do? That's not something I guess practitioners could do, but. Um, uh, basically for the clinical trial, um, it's, we have uh, intensive instructions for the caregivers of the young children, but basically the contents of the capsule are mixed in a fixed amount of liquid mixed appropriately. And then the relevant 
portion is drawn up that can then be administered to the child. Uh, Dr. Peterson, is that uh, what CDC is recommending as well uh, for the for physicians out in, in general practice? Yes, that's correct. For those patients between three kilograms and 13 kilograms, our EAIND also does include instructions for um, opening the capsules and mixing the contents um, with uh, various food products so that that can be uh, apportioned out. Also note that there is an IV formulation um, available, um, which can be used as well for some of those uh, situations where there's uh, a need to ensure uh, appropriate um, dosing uh, if there's any concerns about absorption of the drug. And again, with IV formulation, that's a weight-based dosing as well. It's important to mention that the IV formulation correct me if I'm wrong, it has cyclodextrin, which has some concerns for renal toxicity. Um, uh, so that's, you know, the, the risk benefit does sort of does change with IV as compared to oral. So on one of the slides, I saw that y- you want to take it with a, a fatty meal. So what kind of foods do you recommend? I usually think of mixing um, medicine with applesauce for little kids, but I guess apple, applesauce is not exactly fatty. What do y'all recommend specifically for these little ones? Um, it's been studied uh, with milk um, mm-hmm. and chocolate milk, but basically it's uh, with our pediatric colleagues, anything you can get get to, to mix it in that the kid will take is important, but uh, definitely trying to get some fat in there. So ice cream, yogurt, things like that. Chocolate milk works every time. Okay. Um, Dr. Wilkin, you stay on because this next question, I want to begin with you. Our AMA has a Center for Health Equity, so we're really concerned about this. Uh, how uh, are we ensuring equitable access to TPOX? And then uh, after after Dr. Wilkin gives his point of view, Dr. Peterson, love to hear from you as well. Well, I think the way that we get equitable access is to get unfettered access uh, to the drug. So for it to be available by a simple prescription and stocked widely in pharmacies. And so that is not the case now. And we cannot get there unless we uh, commit to enrolling the clinical trial, unless we get efficacy data. I just think it's important to point out that there is no efficacy data in humans for any condition. And so although it's been approved in the EU, that it's, it's not based on efficacy data. While certainly the experience has been that it well tolerated, people seem to do well, this is not and generally not a lethal disease and it has a very subjective outcome. And so we really, to feel totally confident in our therapies, we need, we need randomized data. And uh, should we need to develop new therapies, it gets incredibly complicated if the therapy you're comparing it to has never been established for efficacy. So I do think that the way that we get access is to have this randomized data so that we can be approved on a more normal pathway. Um, For our clinical trial, we work with clinical trial sites that have a historic, have historically uh, uh, enrolled um, communities of color in research. Um, There a lot of the studies have done a tremendous amount of studies in um, HIV infection. Um, so we have longstanding collaborations with communities and uh, community organizations to, to really uh, increase enrollments of those key populations. Thank you so much. Dr. Peterson, do you have anything to add? I know with my work with the ACIP, we always talk about equity concerns with every vaccine we discuss. Yeah, absolutely. So I certainly agree with uh, Dr. Wilkins' comments. And I would add that from the EAIND um, uh, perspective, we also are working diligently to uh, simplify that process to uh, improve access through the number of um, uh, measures that we've discussed already. Uh, We are also working closely with our state partners to ensure that um, they are able to easily order the product. And in many cases, as I mentioned, pre-position the product so it's uh, um, available and accessible for immediate use. And lastly, we continue to monitor the information that we receive about the individuals receiving Ticavirmat under our EAIND and comparing those demographics to what we're seeing in the outbreak at large to see if there's any discrepancies um, between who's uh, coming down with monkeypox and who's being treated so we can identify any um, inequitable uh, treatment that may be occurring. Uh, so st- stay with us, Dr. Peterson, for this next question. How much does TPOX cost? 
So TPOX is available free of charge. Um, in addition, um, there is uh, if there is a desire to do the PK monitoring or to do testing at CDC for serology or other virologic testing, um, antiviral resistance testing that can also be done free of charge. However, there's not any funding to support uh, any additional laboratory testing, um, but the product itself is free of charge. Great. And uh, do any of you know what billing code should be used for TPOX administration? Um, it, it's per, uh, prescription of oral drugs. So you would use your standard office-based um, visits or video visits, telehealth um, codes. Thank you. All right. We have a bunch of questions about safety and efficacy. Um, what does the current data demonstrate about efficacy of TPOX in individuals with monkeypox? Uh, let's start with uh, Dr. Sherwatt and then go on with Dr. Wilkin and then Dr. Peterson. Great. I was just saying that I think I would just reiterate what was said earlier, which is at present, we have no data from randomized controlled trials that demonstrate safety or efficacy of ticoviramet for the treatment of monkeypox in humans. Um, you know, much of what we've seen has been individual case reports or case series with, with no control. So it's very difficult to know from a safety perspective, you know, how much of the safety that the safety profile we're seeing is driven by monkeypox disease versus the drug, you know, what the time frame for healing is like when you don't have a control arm. So that, that's why we're stressing the importance of having controlled data and making an assessment of safety and efficacy in this setting. So Dr. Wilkin, I know you have your STOMPS clinical trial in progress, but um, do you have any comments to make about efficacy at this point? Um, I understand uh, providers' um, desire for um, access to the drug. Uh, for people that we've treated at our institution, they do seem to respond very well, um, but we, we, we don't we don't have the controlled data for the trial. We do have a data safety monitoring board that, that monitors along the way, and we will look at the data early. And so ideally, if it is such a strong effect, we will be able to um, stop the study early. So um, I'm gonna add a, another little question onto that. Since you're involved in this, this clinical trial, so you're having to deal with these patients every day. What kind of side effects are you seeing? I know when, when Dr. Sherwatt made his presentation, he said nausea and headache and like less than 5% of people, but what are you seeing in, in your trial? Um, well, most of the experience comes through the expanded access uh, trial and people um, tolerate the drug very well. Um, and sometimes it's a little difficult to separate out uh, the side effects from the drug, from the underlying disease, uh, highlighting the need for controlled data. But um, I think people do very well with the drug. That's and they, and they probably like having to take it with uh, chocolate milk or ice cream as well, too. Um, so, um, Dr. Peterson, what about for um, what what is the current data on average time to symptoms improvement following initiation of treatment with TPOX? Uh, what about for patients with HIV? Yeah, thank you. So uh, we have um, monitored um, the data that we're receiving for patients uh, receiving ticoviramat under our EAIND and have summarized that in our recent MMWR. And what we have seen is that um, the median time from initiation of, of the drug to subjective improvement reported by the patients is three days. And there isn't any difference um, in that um, time point uh, between uh, individuals with HIV or without HIV. Um, however, as noted before, this is not a randomized clinical control trial. We do not have a control group. So um, while we can do descriptive analyses of what we're seeing with these patients treated, um, it's not a rigorous, you can't draw rigorous conclusions in terms of either safety or efficacy uh, with what we're seeing. So stay with me, uh, Dr. Peterson. Uh, I know you reviewed this uh, on one of your slides, but this question came up, so let's reinforce this. Can TPOX be prescribed for pregnant or lactating individuals and children? And a follow-up to that, is there any efficacy data in this population? 
Yeah, so the second question first, no, there's no efficacy data in any um, human monkeypox um, cases, uh, but this product can be considered for use in pregnant patients um, and in children and adolescents on a case-by-case -case basis. We have some limited um, case report information and there haven't been any severe adverse events um, associated with those case reports. Uh, and so we, with our limited experience to date, there's been no safety concerns. But again, this uh, should be a, a decision made um, in close consultation um, with the patient weighing all the risk and benefits of uh, potential treatment. Because of the uncertainties of dosing in children, especially younger children, um, our study collects uh, detailed PK information that will run in near real time so that we can actually update the dose of the, for the next child enrolled. So we learn from one child, improve and refine the dosing for the next child. And so PK is the pharmacokinetics, right? Yes. Okay. So are there any, so Dr. Peterson, again, are there any known drug-drug interactions? Um, and are there any drug-drug interactions and in individuals receiving antiretroviral therapy and those receiving prophylaxis against opportunistic infections? Yes, so uh, I think I will defer to my other colleagues. There are some drug-drug uh, interactions that have been observed with um, some uh, uh, diabetic drugs. Um, and in terms of antiretrovirals, that has been uh, modeled. And there are a few um, interactions that have been identified. I'll leave it to Dr. Sherwood, Sherwatt and Dr. Wilkin if they have other specific um, information. Okay, I would echo the same, um, the same comments that were just made. There are Drug drug interaction considerations. The healthcare provider should follow the instructions that are in NIAID's protocol for the RCT or CDC's protocol for the EAP, you know, based on the mechanism under which the, the product is being given. There is also general information on drug interactions in the TPOX US prescribing information. And there's also information at the HHS HIV treatment guidelines website. Uh, particularly detailed information with respect to drug-drug interactions in the setting of ART. But I would turn it over to Dr. Wilkins to talk about the approach to the RCT. Yeah, we um, worked uh, closely with the FDA and gathered the available PK information. And overall, it was thought for people with HIV that the magnitude of the drug interactions and the short duration of treatment, it was very unlikely for it to have any clinical impact. Uh, so we're not uh, doing anything specific with those drug-drug interactions. The one exception that was pointed out is injectable cabotegravir or ropivirine, at least initiating that injectable regimen, which has sort of a, a, a smaller um, window of error with that dosing, uh, but that's really the only limitation. So you, one of you mentioned uh, an interaction with the diabetes drug. Can you be a little more specific? Because a lot of our patients are on diabetes medication, unfortunately. It's it's a very um, it's not a common commonly used diabetic drug. Uh, so it's not the first, second, or third line. Um, the name of the drug is escaping me. Okay, well, we'll follow up on that and, and let it. What? Oh, I was just going to say it's um, rapiglinide, and what was seen was episodes of hypoglycemia in the drug-drug interaction study. I think that the the actual mechanism of the hypoglycemia is a bit unclear, but that was the product, and it's actually outlined in the prescribing information for TPOX as one of the warnings. Dr. Sherwatt, I knew you would know the answer. Thank <laughs> you. Um, all right, uh, Dr. Sherwatt, stay with me. On one of your slides, you talked about neurological findings and the animal toxicology studies. Can you expand on that just a little bit? Sure. So again, this information is also in the product labeling for the drug. So I'll go over that in a little bit of detail. So in a repeat dose toxicology study in dogs, convulsions were observed in one animal within six hours of a single dose of 300 milligrams per kilogram. And that's approximately four times higher than the highest observed human exposure at the recommended human dose based on what we call Cmax, which is the maximum or peak concentration that a drug achieves after dosing. Um, during this study, EEGs were also performed. And EEG findings in this particular animal were consistent with seizure activity during the observed convulsions. Tremors were also observed at a lower dose, the 100 milligram per kilogram dose, 
that's similar to the highest observed human exposure at the recommended human dose, also based on Cmax. Although in that case, there were no convulsions or EEG findings observed at this dose. And it's important to note also on the um, healthy human study that was done as part of the development program, no seizure events occurred. There was one asymptomatic subject who discontinued ticoviramat due to an abnormal EEG. The clinical significance of that finding is unknown. So I'm going to end uh, with one last question. And it's sort of out of the scope of this webinar, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. When available, should physicians be vaccinated against monkeypox? Any takers? So currently, uh, CDC is not um, recommending that um, vaccine be used widely uh, in the vast majority of um, healthcare workers. There are specific healthcare workers for which vaccination is recommended, including laboratory workers who are doing the diagnostic testing for orthopox viruses. But by and large, what we've seen in this outbreak is that nosocomial transmission appears to be very rare. So we um, uh, believe that the risk to most healthcare workers um, is very low, and we're not currently recommending that um, vaccination be given um, to most healthcare workers at this time. Well, we have covered so much today, and I would love to continue this discussion. There are lots of questions we didn't have time to answer, but unfortunately, we're out of time. I'd like to thank Dr. Sherwat, Dr. Wilkin, and Dr. Peterson for joining us today. Thank you for such an incredibly insightful session on this important topic. And as we've heard from our panel of experts, this conversation is far from over. Thankfully, agencies like CDC and FDA are leading efforts to prevent spread of monkeypox, to respond with adequate treatment, and to make that treatment more accessible. During a virtual dialogue earlier this month, the director of WHO, the World Health Organization, Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, reminded us, we must continue to work hard to ensure that inequities in access to vaccines, testing and treatment during the height of the COVID pandemic are not repeated. At the end of last month, nearly 28% of monkeypox cases in the US were among black individuals and 33% among Hispanics. AMA's headquarters are in Chicago, and Chicago's public health commissioner, Dr. Allison Ardwitty, said Chicago health officials have prioritized monkeypox vaccine distribution to providers who primarily serve Latino populations who comprise 31% of cases in the city of Chicago. Getting vaccines to those who need them most remains an ongoing and critical part of our response system and ultimately fighting this disease. Together, CDC, FDA, the AMA, and each of you here today can be a part of the collected effort to respond to monkeypox. WHO Director Gabriezas also said, if COVID has taught us nothing else, it's taught us that health is the most precious commodity on earth. It's a commodity that must be cherished, prized, and fought for every day. As you've heard here today, TPOX is available in our strategic national stockpile. ACIP, the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, recommends vaccination for those at high risk following a confirmed monkeypox exposure. Again, we could talk about this for several more hours, but we are out of time. Many thanks again to our wonderful guests and to all of you for taking time out of your busy day to join us. And please, please join us again for future segments in AMA's What Physicians Need to Know webinar series. Thank you and have a great day. 